Hello everyone, I'm Patricia and first of all, thank you so much if you are watching or listening to us. I'm so grateful that our Voices of Leader community is growing every day and I'm more excited about today's interview. Welcome to Voices of Leaders, where we select and interview CEOs, entrepreneurs, scientists and experts from all around the world. Currently, we are looking into this pandemic from a social and environmental point of view, analyzing its effect on countries and businesses worldwide so we can know more about what our futures will be like. So today's business leader is Eric Gatenholm. He's an American entrepreneur that wants to change the world with medicine. He is the CEO and co-founder of Selink, the first bioink company in the world. Those who are not familiarized with bioprinters, they can print human tissues and organs, meaning that this technology can completely change the world of modern medicine. Eric himself has won numerous awards, from MIT Review 35 Under 35 to Entrepreneur of the Year in 2019, and as well he has been included in Forbes 30 Under 30 list. And to finalize, last year he revealed the truth on bioprinting at his TED Talk in Sweden. On behalf of Voices of Leaders team, Eric Gatenholm, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Deva Sen. Well, thank you so much, first of all, for having me. I, I really appreciate it. It's, it's an honor to, to talk to you guys and, and, and of course, help inform the community and, and, and help you build that. Uh, before we talk about the current situation and the work Cellink is doing now, I'd like to talk about how you got started in the world of biotech and the beginnings of Cellink. Now, you've got an academic background in business, economics, law from universities, including uh, the University of Gothenburg and Virginia Tech. And before Cellink, you had already co-founded uh, BC Genesis. How did you first come to get interested and involved in biotechnology? And how did Cellink first come into being? Um, I think it's a, a great question in terms of getting started. A lot of a lot of young people are thinking about how to get started with businesses today and, and different fields to get in. Um, my came um, my field came quite close from my family. My father was a professor and in, in, um, in biomaterials. My sister is a doctor. I had a lot of medical, um, you know, I had the medical field essentially around me as I was growing up, which made it very natural for me to either fight it as a, uh, as a rebellious person or eventually perhaps go with it. And I think, you know, half, half of my life I, I, was, I was choosing to fight it and then the rest of my life I've chosen to go with it and, and do the best, out of, the best out of the situation in the medical field. Um, in terms of selling how I got started, I was, I was uh, recently I moved from the U.S. to Sweden. And, and in Sweden, I, I got involved with uh, a few uh, researchers at, at the university, at the Chalmers University, uh, where they had developed a, a novel biomaterial that was um, essentially enabling human cells to grow within it uh, in an optimized manner so that you could culture larger tissues and, and bits and pieces of organs. And that was, of course, very fascinating to me. So, so I, uh, I decided to take the step and start the business and purchase essentially that IP and those patents and then build the company on that technology. How has the current situation actually affected Cellink? What is work like for you right now? And how has the crisis affected any short-term or, or long-term plans that, that you had? It's a great question. And, and as... Uh, as a company, of course, we're fighting with the same challenges everyone else is around the world. And I think that's what's so unique about this economic situation. You know, you're, you're looking at typically at national situations and things and crises that are hitting individual countries, and you know, they can expect the companies within those countries to be faced with certain uh, economical downturns or, or upturns. But in this case, everybody's in the same boat. So that means that, you know, the challenges that I have uh, on the European market or in the American market when supplying my products, I know my competitors have that same challenge. We've switched around a lot of our R&D departments to focus heavier on, on producing products that are essential for healthcare providers and also healthcare institutions. So quite early on in this, in this crisis, we went over to start manufacturing hand sanitizers. Uh, that was one of those products that was quite um, in, in close proximity 
to, um, to what we were doing initially, which is our biomaterials. We're a biomaterials company, so moving over to making gels and different other liquids was quite easy, and we had those manufacturing capabilities already. Uh, whilst the biotechnology sector might be positively affected by the current situation in terms of maybe private and public funding in, in the near future, there are definitely going to be changes in all industries and sectors in the, in the post-COVID era. So just as you guys have uh, shifted your focus slightly, what changes do you expect to see within the biotechnology sector as a whole in the, in the coming years? How do you believe the, the focus of some biotech businesses might, uh, might shift? Great question. I, th I think um, I think the biotech sector and the life sciences sector in general is going to grow faster and heavier in the next coming years, specifically from the reason that it essentially took most of most of the businesses and industries and economic economies around the world off guard. Everybody was taken off guard. We were, uh, you know, the healthcare industry has essentially experienced something that they've never experienced before. Um, lack of supplies, lack of vaccines, lack of um, lack of protective gear, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that this gives governments an idea of essentially saying, "Hey, you know, we should probably invest more money in biotech, and we should probably try to stay ahead of the innovation curve, specifically in the life sciences industry." So I think that from you know from both from private but also public research institutes and 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 governmental organizations. My hope is that that uh, more will invest heavier in biotech in the coming years. Bearing that in mind, do you think accessibility and affordability are going to become of even higher importance in the near future when it comes to areas associated with health, such as biotech, medical devices, and and pharmaceuticals? Absolutely, I I, uh, I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, you know cost effectiveness and user friendliness of uh, biotechnologies and life sciences as products is going to be essential and our focus as a company is really to disrupt this this notion that only well-funded institutions should afford the latest technologies so so as a company what we're doing is that we're trying to push down prices as much as we can to enable researchers and essentially enable everybody to work with something that could change the world of medicine. Uh, do you also collaborate with any public healthcare systems or do you have any new exciting collaborations lined up? One recent one that we, we just uh, announced a few weeks ago was an extension of a collaboration with AstraZeneca. So AstraZeneca in, in Gaithersburg, uh, Maryland, we've been working with them for a few years now in terms of developing um, workflows so that they can also enhance the way they develop drugs. So that's one of the one of the areas that we focus on is is providing these technology pharmaceutical companies to try to speed up uh, the drug discovery process, but also reduce the costs of that process. So you can think of our technology platform as more of a fail safe or fail fast system where you we try to get these pharma companies and biotech companies to fail a lot faster and in turn save money. Looking well into the future and considering the progress that is surely yet to come, how far do you think this, this biotechnology can go in, say, 10, 15 years? It's probably something beyond most of our imaginations, but maybe you would be able to paint a, a clearer picture of it. If you're looking at 10, 15 years down the road, I mean, I think that we're looking into a, a world where um, a lot of different medical devices uh, are, are being bioprinted or 3D printed. Uh, we already see today that a lot of medical devices are 3D printed. So for instance, for hip implants or for knee replacements, uh, there, is a, there is an ability to 3D print those implants specifically for the patients. So, so I definitely see that path uh, forward. Uh, but then also I see the bioprinters being, you know, continuously used in the drug discovery and, and cosmetic development process where, where researchers, you know, if they want to develop a new drug, it's a faster process. They will be going from, you know, from a drug candidate to perhaps clinical trials in, in, in a much faster manner. And where bioprinting is, is just, a, it's a, you know, a standardized way of doing things. You, you wouldn't see yourself doing anything else. And that kind of goes also with animal trials, right? I mean, we, we're, we're still using animal trials for a lot of our research in laboratories around the world. 
it's kind of a, a standardized testing system. But if we think about it, it's, 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 it's 2020, um, you know, in 10 years. Uh, I don't think that animal trials will be that popular anymore. What is the kind of leadership you believe we need and you would like to see in the coming months and years as the world looks to recover from the, from the wide-reaching effects of the, of the pandemic? I mean, we, we humans, we think that this crisis will just go away eventually, right? I mean, we're hoping that we will do our phase outs, we will start going out to society, and all of a sudden, in a matter of just a day or a night, it all switches back to normal. Mm -hmm. And I, I got bad news for those people. I don't think that that's what's going to happen. I, I strongly believe that we will have this period of time of uncertainty where you are afraid of shaking someone's hand you're afraid of being in a meeting with too many people at the same time because you're you're still scarred from that period of time where this coronavirus was affecting all of us so i think that during this time it's important for leaders to be courageous and and lead the way in terms of how we should behave as humans and be okay with the different styles of behaviors be open for diversity the world is calling for increased diversity during these times of change. And that diversity is going to be an enabler for companies that can be flexible and agile, right? So if you are a company or a leader or a CEO and you're not open to this change or this, or you're not flexible to, to the diversity of the people around you, you're going to have a very, you're going to have a very hard time adapting to the new environment.